Good evening ladies and gentlemen. It's over a year since I was booked to give this talk. Little did we know at the time that 2020 had in store for us. At least by the way of modern technology, the talk can still go ahead, even though it's very strange feeling sitting here talking to myself, so I apologise in advance for any pauses and errors. The talk is entitled A Tale of Three Chariots, Iron Age Burials in Pocklington. My name is Paula Ware and I work for Map Archaeological Practice based in Moulton, North Yorkshire. Our recent work has captured the imagination of the archaeological world and the media. Early in my career, working with my colleague Mark Stevens, we were working on Tony Brewster's archive. We were sorting out the chariot burial from Garden Slack and commented on the possibility that one day we would get the opportunity to, we hoped that one day we would get the opportunity to excavate such a site. Throughout the 80s, 90s and early 2000s, we heard about Ian Stead's discoveries and the find at Wet One through Tony Pasito. In 2017, things were about to change for us, accumulating with the most exciting finds over a period of three years. This talk will reveal new information with regard to the burial rite of the Middle to Late Iron Age or Aris culture concentrating on three sites in Pocklington and a further one at Melton. The sites in Pocklington, Burnby Lane, The Mile, and one on Yappam Road, and this site down here at Melton. The sites have been discovered during archaeological excavations in, in order to facilitate housing developments. And to say the least, the finds were not expected. The first site in Pocklington was the Burnby Lane site, situated on the southern fringe of the town in the valley bottom at the edge of the, south of the Yorkshire Wolds dip slope at an elevation of 30, 30 metres. The archaeological potential of the location was initially highlighted by aerial photographs taken by Derek Riley in the summer of 1973. So you can see these marks here and some under the housing. The Burnby Line site is surrounded by a series of crop marks that were plotted as part of the world's mapping programme. A series of round and square rectangular enclosures, presumably barrows, and a multi-ditch feature are known on the eastern side of Burnby Lane. Overlapping with the southern part of the excavated area, Immediately north of the site and now underneath housing, more crop marks were photographed, showing two groups of square barrows with linear features and what appears to be a larger round barrow beyond. The fact that the site had been left as pasture obviously helped with the preservation of the site. Geophysical survey undertaken by wires predicted features to be present on the site and this was borne out with trial trenching. The trench has been placed over the anomalies. There is mounting evidence to support the theory that geophysical survey is not a reliable tool on the local geology of glaciofugal sands and gravels over a solid geology of red mercy and mudstones, but Burnby Lane was the first to acknowledge the problem. The earliest features on the site are the four features, features highlighted in red, of which three, one, two, three, can be securely dated to the Bronze Age. The larger feature to the north could be as, as early as possibly Neolithic. The evidence is clear that the area in and around Pocklington is a significant and previously unrecognised multi-phase landscape. More to follow on this aspect. It was soon apparent that the site contained the recognised burial rites that indicate the cemetery was probably used for 200 to 300 years. The overview of the cemetery. We had two Bronze Age burials, 172 burials in total, of which two are Bronze Age, 130 Iron Age and 40 Anglian. 
83 Iron Age barrows were identified, mostly square or rectangular, but with seven circular examples placed in the site in the category of a larger cemetery, which include Arras, Danes Graves, Burton Fleming, Wetwang, Gartenslack and Rudston. The majority of the Iron Age burials were interned in the crouched position, but also included flexed, tightly contracted and even prone. Box coffin-like structures were identified by sharply defined edges and interpreted as self-supporting shuttered boxes. Grave goods, although rare, were present in some 20% of burials and included brooches, bracelets and weapons. The development of the cemetery The development of the cemetery was shown by the form of the actual barrow and the stratigraphic relationship between them. Using the size and other characteristics of the barrows, it's possible to apply Denton Halcon's tripartite barrow typology to the Burnby Lane Cemetery. Under this typology, Group 1 barrows usually have a large enclosed area but lack central graves, which were presumably either placed on the original ground surface or in the barrow mound, essentially in very shallow graves removed by later truncation. Nine barrows are assign assigned to this group. Six barrows had no surviving primary burials, and these were generally some of the largest barrows, measuring over seven metres internally. These would appear to be the earliest square barrows, and the space between them was filled with group two barrows. This is an example of a group one barrow here, and you can see the group two barrows clearly defined by the snow. Group two barrows have enclosures of varying size with shallow, medium, or occasionally deep graves. This is the largest group with the, within the cemetery and 48 barrows are assigned to this group. In the northeastern barrow group, a sequence of three intercutting group two barrows began with the construction of a moderately sized square barrow that had a bowed northern ditch and an off-center adult bur burial. Another slightly larger square barrow substantially overlaid barrow 40, but without any surviving burial. A smaller square barrow then clipped the southwest corner of barrow 39 and contained the primary burial of an adult within a box in a relatively deep rectangular grave. Group 2 barrows are represented by this barrow and it's a, bur a burial crouched facing east, see in a deep grave. Group three barrows have generally small, often curvilinear enclosures and had deep graves over 0.6 metres. Group three barrows and flat graves are placed between the group two barrows. Within the northeastern barrow group, five group three circular barrows, two, three, four, five, occupied a band between group two square barrows. It's clear that the circular barrows post-date the other barrows, and in one instance, circular barrow, barrow 34, cut into an earlier square barrow. 26 barrows are assigned to this group. The circular barrows were between 4.2 metres and 4.5 metres in diameter. And you can come back to these circular barrows, which are of great interest to me. Barrow 38, a group two barrow contained a partial skeleton of a juvenile pig, the only recovered example of a food offering. And this is quite a rare occurrence in terms of Iron Age cemeteries, which seem to have a predom predominance of such of food offerings. Barrow two, this barrow down here, contained the skeleton of a mature woman buried in a central grave with a brooch and copper alloy bracelet on each wrist. The bracelets were of different forms and one had a coral inlay. Let's see here, bracelets and there's a brooch. Let's 
and this is the um, bracelet after conservation you can see the coral inlay here quite clearly and obviously presumably these were some possible glass beads on either side but they've been they've been lost in antiquity um, it would be really interesting to know where the coral came from was it from the Mediterranean the Red Sea or even possibly the North Sea and um, there's ongoing work into this at the present time And then we have the H-shaped brooch. Um, we had 16 bow brooches and three were in copper alloy and the rest were in iron, familiar from Yorkshire Iron Age cemeteries. But this H-shaped brooch is an unusual form and it's the first to be found um, within a stratigraphic context. Weapons and chariots. And this is what I think captures um, the media, um, the thought of warriors um, buried with their weapons and chariots or carts. Barrow 34 was a large and deep grave and contained the skeleton of a young adult aged between 18 to 25. He was buried within a structure along with an iron sword and a group of five spearheads and a possible feral. The body had been speared as part of the um, burial rite. He was in a crouched position. Um, 70 to 80% of the skeleton survived and he had um, his sword placed in the burial with him. There were also textile fragments adhering to the scabbard. And see here the sword, crouch burial, and the spears running along his spine. Um, he was obviously afforded this ritual of spearing that has been noticed in other uh, Wells burials, um, but this was the only spear burial that we had at Burnby Lane. His well preserved sword measuring um, 75 millimetres, consisting of an iron blade, and there were organic traces of the wooden scabbard. It had a horn hilt with a copper alloy button, high camp amulet, and two iron washers. And it's comparable with Stead's 184, 185, both in the British Museum, from Rudston, East Riding. Barrow 37, was very, it was located very closely um, to the sword circular, was another individual, but he's older. He's a male aged 36 to 45, and he was 90% complete. He was in a round barrow, 5.2 uh, metres in diameter, and placed once again within a box. He's crouched facing east, and his grave goods included the organic stain of a shield and several nails and fittings. And see the outline here, the organic stain of the shield. So he was placed on the remains of a rectangular shield, which was shown by a line of rivets along the spine of the shield and its grip, plus soil markings at the base of the grave. Let's see here. In Barrow 32, another circular barrow with the 0.6 deep grave cut into the water table. And as you can see from the photograph, doesn't look that impressive. Um, but once again, he was a male aged 17 to 25. He had perimortem at death trauma, suffered a mixture of blade injuries, blunt force and penetrating injuries, injuries to the left and right arms, right hand, left hand, left pelvis, left leg, and odd breaks to the ribs. There is a tantalising piece of evidence surviving from this grave that could be suggestive of part of a shield and work is ongoing. You can see down here. And it resembles one of the rivets that was found in the previous shield burial. Why this guy was buried prone is another interesting um, question whether we'll ever find the answer but I think it is 
um, possible that he's afforded the same right of burial, but there was a fear of this man and that's why he was placed prone. The cut had been delivered from above and to the right and angled into the bone slightly. It had penetrated most of the way through the cranial vault and the internal part of the vault had fractured. Let's see this here. But another curiosity, within the mouth cavity, two that one tooth, third molar, uh, was located. And you can see that this showed that he had had either some object had knocked his tooth out after he died um, because he didn't have the reflux to be able to um, push the tooth out of his mouth. It was found within his mouth cavity. This poor guy had really had um, a beating. The final square barrow was only excavated in 2017 because the verge had to, remo had to be removed um, to, for the widening of the road. And it saved the best to last in the form of a cart burial. And why I use the term cart burial, um, I have been picked up on this, but there's no evidence to suggest any decorative objects uh, were, con were contained within the burial. But I should point out that the, the grave had been truncated by later medieval ploughing. The ditches were relatively insubstantial and enclosed a large central grave that measured 3.6 by 2.6 metres. Both ponies lay with their heads to the north facing each other. The western pony on its left side and the eastern, eastern one on its right. The eastern pony was definitely male but it was not possible to sex the western one as the crucial part of the mandible was missing. The right foreleg of the western pony was bent northwards towards the muzzle of the eastern pony, but the foot was missing. The right hind leg was also missing, but the left hind leg was bent or arranged to the south. The right sides of the pelvis and the skull were truncated. The tail appeared to be bent back along the spine and was possibly represented by a soil stain. The ribs partly overlay the left foreleg of the eastern pony. The eastern pony faced west towards its western fellow and was in a better state of preservation than its western fellow, although the hind legs were truncated. The right foreleg lay, lay beneath the soil stain of the pole and the left foreleg lay above it, extending westwards underneath the ribcage of the western pony. It's clear from the range of bones represented that the animals were entire when placed in the grave. At the present time, it's not possible to age the ponies other than to say they were mature. Measurable bones, a radius and metamarcal metacarpal were only recovered from one of the ponies and indicate an animal of approximately 1.29 at the withers, just under 13 hands. This compares with 1.34 and 1.42 from the Kirkburn cart and 1.32 and 1.3 from the Kingsborough Arras. It's certainly safe to assume the two Pockington animals represent draft animals used to pull a cart. A radiocarbon date on one of the horses dates the barrow to 250 BC. Unfortunately, the grave was truncated by later disturbance, which had removed the upper part of the grave and most of its southwestern corner. However, the high and tire and the lower nave band of the, on the eastern wheel remained in situ, and the lower nave band of the western wheel was also present. The wheel rim, the hub and its 12 spokes were recorded, a soil marks which partly overlay an iron horse bit. Another soil mark represented the cart pole, which extended northwards from the wheel for circa 2.6 metres. The truncated remains of the accompanying human burial were placed over the southern part of the pole and were framed between the hind legs of two mature ponies. The 
depth skill of the excavator is reflected in the photo revealing the wheel from the so soil stains. Melton. Until recently, this site had to be known as Site X. Located down on the Humber. Once again, was part of um, excavation um, in advance of development. And the first area we looked at, wow, this is exciting, we thought, these circular barrows. But these are, in fact, first phase of excavation, um, revealed these round barrows and they contain single and double cremations. And the, the barrow dimensions, while similar um, to previous ones that we have seen, between three and four metres in diameter, actually belong to the Bronze Age. Just going to play a video for you, taking you back um, to the actual excavations and you can see um, that we, the excavations reveal 10 Iron Age square barrows with dimensions of between 8 and 10 metres internally and deep barrow ditches, some up to 70 centimetres. And they have been provisionally placed in the Group 1 category. All but one of the barrows had a central grave. Bone preservation on the site was very good and the site contained 43 inhumations, include, including nine neonates. In contrast to Pocklington, this site had an abundance of animal bone deposits, both in graves and in separate pits. The animal bones and shells indicate a diet dominated by the meat from domestic animals. In contrast to Pocklington, this site had an abundance of animal bone deposits, both in graves and in separate pits. The animal bones and shells indicate a diet dominated by the meat from domestic animals. Marine resources and wild animals were barely utilised. Marine resources and wild animals were barely utilised and no chickens were noted. It's likely that the main domestic animals, cattle, sheep and pigs, were raised locally based on the presence of neonatal bones and older breeding stock. Sheep and pigs were targeted for prime meat in particular, while older sheep were probably maintained for their fleeces and milk, and mature cattle were used for milk or for traction. What makes this assemblage significant, though, is the presence of unusual or atypical deposits, such as complete skulls, partial skeletons and complete carcasses. These indicate that the majority of this assemblage does not reflect everyday animal husbandry, and dietary choices. Instead, some deposits may represent fertility rites, e.g. the inclusion of juvenile and neonatal remains, feasting, butchered bones, sacrifice, e.g. cremated bone, and consider the cremated sheep goat from ditch 836, or burial rites where animals were specially selected as grave goods. Barrow 1473, located in the southeast corner of the site, contained a juvenile in the central grave, close to the barrow ditch, five shallow pits contain, contained animal bone. Due to the compact nature of the deposits, it's feasible to speculate that the bones were contained within organic material, such as leather. The function of these pits is interesting. Is it evidence of feasting or individual offerings? offered over a period of, of time. Barrow 4A3 contained a mature male al aligned east-west facing south, but it was the content of the grave that stood out. Placed in the grave were three goats and three pigs. It is clear that the entire animal animals had been deposited, even though butchery marks to the necks of all three goats suggest they might have been beheaded although their heads still made it into the pit. The young age of all the animals appears to indicate clear selection and the sacrifice of valuable resources, in particular, the loss of prime meat. 
a cattle cranium from the ditch associated with this square barrow was poleaxed, designed to stun or kill the animal by means of a forceful perc percussive blow to the frontal bone. Interestingly, a single butchered horse bone was also noted. A pelvis located in the ditch, this displayed the marks of dismemberment, but whether the animal was processed for human consumption is unknown. Interestingly, seven neonates were also placed in the northwest corner of the barrow ditch. Radiocarbon date has been obtained from the skeleton for 330 to 204 BC. But once again, the exciting discovery of a nave hoop here in the ground led us to believe that possibly we had another chariot. Wow. And yes, indeed we did. And like the majority of the other Barrow ditches, Barrow 720, the ditches were relatively insubstantial, as you can see here and here. But enclosed a large central grave that measured 4.2 and 2.6. Unlike Pocklington, this grave had not been disturbed. The dismantled chariot had been placed in the grave with all key structural elements seen as soil stains. Soil stains here. The mature male skeleton was placed in a crouched position on a north-south alignment facing east. Although the evidence is tentative, Soil stains suggest that the skeleton was placed on the superstructure and two iron linchpins placed on either side of the burial. Placed on the hip was a hip skull and a uh, was a pig skull and a shoulder in the East Yorkshire tradition. The pole is in two parts, with only the top part of the pole being in close position to attach to the yoke. Yoke here pole and the other part of the pole here. The axle and pole were not attached. Axle here. The wheels have 12 spokes and measure 88 centimetres. Both upper and lower nave hoops are present. The iron tyres were both in, lifted intact and early observation indicated wood still adhering to them both. The organic remains of the yoke revealed four copper alloy terrets and three other copper alloy fittings. Two of the copper alloy items were placed either side of the position where the yoke would have fitted the pole. The purpose of these items was surely decorative and early indications are they are intricately decorated and with leather remnants surviving, indicating possible survival of the reins. The third item was both functional and decorative, and with a copper alloy front and an iron back, timber is clearly seen between the two elements. And the function of this object is still a mystery, but it has been speculated that it could have been the same function as the later fifth, ter fifth turret seen in later chariots. This is one of the turrets here, as it's come out of the ground. And then we've got the nave hoop here and a snaffle bit. Um, a double jointed snaffle bit and two lynch were also lynch pins were also located. One of the nave hoops had a sample of wood surviving identified as ash. As the mineralized wood from the inside surface, one of the tires, is also of this species. This shows that for this chariot, the fellows and axle were made of the same species. Another interesting feature is that the wood overlays a layer of fibrous material, possibly leather or skin, suggesting the hoop had a lining of leather acting as a sort of washer. The other nave hoops only retain the fibrous layer and do not have the remains of wood. A radiocarbon date has been obtained from the skeleton for 328 to 204 BC, really closely linked to the previous um, barrow with the goats in. The mile at Pocklington. This is the second site at Pocklington and we start to go for our excavations um, onto the mile where we were supposed to be excavating an enclosed Saxon settlement of Saxon date. 
absolutely fantastic. But in, um, unfortunately, um, this site seems to have been just sort of ignored um, in the media um, and where they've really concentrated on the unexpected Iron Age discoveries. Um, the site revealed a multi-phased landscape from the Neolithic with leaf-shaped flint, Neolithic pottery, um, of Durrington Wall type, Peterborough Ware, Mortlake type, early Bronze Age Beaker, 2500 to 1800 BC, um, revealing that the site had a long 6,000 years of history of activity, um, which had pr previously only been recognised from aerial photographs. Outside of the excavation area, a round barrow, circa seven metres in diameter, was located with a deep central grave. Fortunately for us, we had been um, left to strip the entire site, um, and we were very fortunate um, to find this round barrow. Once again, with a central grave. Ah, oh, one of those circular Iron Age barrows seen from the ground here. Five skeletons were located at the mile, dating to the Iron Age, one in a square barrow, more of which later, one in a round barrow, this one, two in plain graves and one in a possible rubbish pit. Three were adults, one juvenile and one fetus. The ritual of death of skeleton 303, which was placed in this circular barrow, in a deep central grave, makes for intriguing analysis especially with the association of the adjacent grave here. Skeleton 303 was a male, 18 to 25 years old. I think we've heard that before. 1.68 metres tall, making him taller than the mean average Iron Age, but smaller than the average height of the Burnby Lane male population. 303 had suffered from chronic sinusitis and minor developmental anomalies of the lower spine. He also revealed dental disease suggesting periods of stress, probably relating to malnutrition or disease in childhood. Crouched, lying on the left side with both hands close to face, orientated north, northeast, south, southwest, rich in grave goods that included four bronze shield components, five ferrous spearheads and three bone spearheads. Once again, we can say this is a spear burial. He's buried with his shield. He's in a round circular barrow and he's aged 17 to 25. Sounds familiar. Hence my reason for the interest in these round barrows. Three ferrous and one bone spearhead had been driven into the body. Two ferrous and one bone spearhead were placed by the body and one bone spearhead driven into the grave, but not the body. Skeleton 303 was a male, 18 to 25. Further evidence for the warrior theme is suggested by 303 having sustained several traumatic lesions and were represented by two anti-mortem nasal fractures which had healed blunt force trauma on the frontal bone. These injuries hint at the possibility of a less mundane circumstances of trauma and possibly the use of a weapon. It's also apparent that there had been de deliberate damage to the shield at point of insertion into the grave. The mild shield was not complete. It had definitely been damaged and only the bronze elements survive and the parallels with the Chertsey shield can be seen. This is the Chertsey shield here. Four elements survive, including the rivets and rivet holes, and two heart-shaped elements make up the boss. Skeleton 274 was in a plain grave and located just two metres from the round barrow. Whilst excavating the burial, we commented on the likelihood of it being a female. There was just something poignant about the burial. Once again, crouched, lying on the left side, buried face down, with both hands underneath the left side of the face. Our speculation was correct. 
274 was female aged 18 to 25 and had measured 1.5 meters tall and is shorter than the national iron age average and the burn belaying range she had suffered from early childhood stress evidence in the form of cribria orbitalitala pitting in the orbital roof in her orbits and dental enamel enamel hyperplasia in her teeth both conditions found in agricultural iron age communities and connected with chronic infections, unhygienic environments, and dietary de deficiency. She also had a congenital uh, abnormality called spina bifida occulta, which meant the back of her tailbone was open, though the nerves were covered in soft tissue. A number of lesions were also observed on certain ribs and appeared bent inwards into the thoracic cage. Other ribs did not display this malformation and looked normal. The abnormalities observed do not appear to be congenital, but could be the result of constriction of the chest, such as from a corset. This would be highly unusual for the period and requires further investigation. Both 303 and 274 skeletons had traits in their ankles suggesting habitual squatting. It's strange how we become attached to certain elements from a site. And the last few years have definitely provided a few of those moments, but the discovery of the next barrow can only be described as a Howard Carter moment. The ditches of the square barrow enclosed an area approximately 6.5 metres across. The grave was placed centrally within the enclosed area and measured 4.4 metres from north to south and 2.4 metres from west to east and over one metre deep. Its large size indicating the exceptional burial that it contained. The first possibility that we encountered that we might have another chariot was these unstratified turrets, which bore an increasing resemblance to the ones found at the King's Barrow at Pataras. They were made from copper alloy um, and, were, and were recovered from the top of the grave. And you can see here that they also have coral. Um, this has once been described as possible, looking like resembling mistletoe. The remains of the chariot were largely complete, apart from the yoke, and appeared to be still assembled together, with the wheels upright and attached by the naves to the axle, which were approximately two metres in length. It's clear that the axle was a substantial piece of timber, 14 centimetres thick, and wood remains on the interior of the nave bands indicate that it was made from ash. A dark soil stain indicated the position of the chariot body, which was relatively narrow and shallow, with a tapered front end. It had a length of 1.45 internally, with a width of 0.65 to the east, dropping to 0.25 at the north. The chariot body rested on top of the axle, but there were no indications of how the superstructure and the axle were joined together. The remains of the pole consisted of an intermittent, intermittent soil stain that dipped down from the front of the chariot towards the rear and was at least 1.3 metres long. And this is the soil stain you can just see here coming through underneath the skeleton. Both naves appear to be roughly flush with the axle. Let's see the nave here. And judging by the position of the nave hoops was 30 centimetres long. Of the four copper alloy nave hoops, three were similar in form with medial raised bands that no doubt provided both decoration and strengthening. The other nave hoop was much narrower plain ring. The linchpins were tapering iron bars linked to iron rings at their top ends and also had rounded knobs at the top ends with small knobs at the lower ends. Using, using the distance between the outside of the upright iron tyres as a guide, the chariot had a gauge of circa 1.58 metres. The iron tyres were 900 mil in diameter, 4 mil wide and 1.5 metre thick. Evidence of six spokes were indicating one wheel 
by our organic staining. Their position showed that the wheels originally had 12 spokes, similar to both the previous chariots. The wooden rim had sh had, was shown by a 30 mil wide band of organic staining on the inside of the iron tire. We had plenty of visitors to all three excavations of the chariot, including Ian Stead and John Dent. What makes this chariot unique? A pair of upright horses, ponies, the amount of pig skulls surrounding the skeleton, the presence of a feasting spit meat hook, and further evidence to support the funeral meal with rites of passage, and in this case, a link to a warrior. The burial was placed directly on top of a wood copper alloy composite shield, which was laid face downwards. In our imaginations when we were on site, we wondered could it possibly have parallels with the ones with shield, just fantas fantasizing. The ones with shield had been found in the mid 19th century and was now in the British Museum. It was a bronze circular shield and de decorated in Latin style with bold repoussé decoration. It was acclaimed at the time as an outstanding piece of Iron Age art. Oh, how we wished. Back to the chariot itself. As we can see here, this is the position of the shield, the horses here and the chariot. The, po the ponies were buried in an upright position at the chariot's front end, in keeping with the intact nature of the chariot. They were posed as if they were galloping or trotting. Unfortunately, their heads had been truncated by ploughing, making it impossible to sex the animals and infer if any selection was involved. The bones were all fused, so it was clear that these were not juvenile animals. The radiocarbon date indicates that the man died between the mid 4th and mid 2nd century. This is completely consistent with the radiocarbon results of burials from other chariots in East Yorkshire. Wet Wang Slat, Wet Wang Village, Bury Fryston in West Yorkshire, Garden Slat, Garden Station in Kirkburn. So who was the person within the barrow? Well, he was a male aged 46 plus, and I would con say considerably older, crouched lying on right side, orientated north-south with both hands close to the face and 1.74 metres in height and an average iron age, or and off average iron age height. He had advanced spinal joint disease and most of his teeth had been lost before death, giving him the affectionate name of Gummy during excavation. During life, he sustained a number of traumatic lesions, including a fracture of the lumbar vertebrae. This suggested that he was physically active and that he possibly engaged in repeated bending and lifting of the lower back. He also suffered from trauma to his left thigh and had a broken rib that was healing at the time of death. In fact, the degree of healing may suggest that the fracture took place more than three weeks prior to death. He had suffered from possible osteoporosis as demonstrated by the reduction of weight in bones. Isotope analysis undertaken by Derek Hamilton has revealed even more insight into the individual. The strontium, oxygen and sulphur isotope results provide a clue to where the individual lived in his childhood and nearer, to his, nearer his death. These isotopes each provide a different strand of evidence. While oxygen isotopes are linked to the drinking water, the strontium ratio is connected to the geological age of the rocks on which the food was grown or raised, and the sulphur of the type, to the type of rocks and sediments that make up the underlying geology. It's important to note that where there is a vast amount of isotopic data for the Aras culture in East Yorkshire, there is nothing um, for the Pocklington area. And the burials in and around Pocklington are different to the Upper Wolds, being on Upper Cretaceous Chalk and the Pocklington ones on the Triassic, Triassic sedimentary rocks, mudstone, sandstone, saltstones, which are much older. The strontium ratio is an expected value for someone whose subsistence base comes from areas underlain by the older Triassic rocks and not the Upper Cretaceous Chalk. Similarly, the oxygen isotope value is consistent with someone from the Midlands, though suggestive of someone perhaps from slightly further west than Pockington. Finally, the sulphur value is consistent with data from the East York Yorkshire Chalk. Taken together, all indications are that SK424 
was an individual who was raised locally to the area around Pockington. The sulphur results provide an interesting glimpse into the movement of individuals in their lifetime, while also highlighting the inancient nature of our understanding of the distribution of sulphur isotopes in Britain. While the tooth denting sulphur isotopes are indic indicative of a person whose food was grown and raised on the chalk, the rib bone is considerably different, showing that SK424 lived in a different place in his childhood than he did in his final years before his death. At the moment, there are no baseline values from archaeological remains from the same geology as Pocklington. And so it's impossible to say with clear confidence that the childhood sulphur value is consistent with the area around the burial site, but only that it is consistent with the chalk, which lies three kilometres to the east. Furthermore, the lower sulphur value from the rib bone could be consistent with the area around Pocklington or some other area further afield, including the Paris Basin. It is possible that Skeleton 424 was locally raised and then went on to live somewhere else, taking on a new isotopic signature in their bones before returning to Pocklington just prior to or in death. This is an exciting possibility, especially given the nature of the burial rite. Ongoing isotopic work from the sites in, the Wessex, in Wessex dating to the same period have identified individuals who were raised locally on the Wessex chalk, but who moved away for their adult life and were subsequently buried in sites on the chalkland. Albeit their burials were not markedly different from the people who appeared to remain local throughout life. Might Skeleton 424 represent another middle iron age individual who moved in life but maintained a close connection to from where they came to be buried in or near their childhood place of birth. As we investigate an increasing number of individuals from across East Yorkshire and the Southwest, we are likely to begin to develop new understandings of iron age connectivity that moves us beyond the economic motives of trade and exchange and considers deep familiar connections that are maintained across space and time. And the forlorn looking um, grave after excavation. And now we move to the conservation um, this is Max Felter from York Archaeological Trust um, and their conservation team um, who has worked on all three sites uh, with us um, and this is her um, starting to remove one of the tyres from the excavation. You can see the tyres wrapped and you can see the mineralised wood once conservation has started. A small iron spearhood, spearhead rather, um, that was from the speared burial 303. Um, it's in a fair condition. The surface is covered with dark red and orange brown corrosive products and encrusted with soil with stone inclusion and remains of past corrosive blisters. It's now been, it's now been made stable um, and had this stable, been able to stabilize the cracks in the blade. There are patches of mineralized wood near the join between the blade and the socket, just here, as well as a thin layer inside the socket. Unfortunately, not en enough material survived to be, able to, to be able to identify the species. Part of the blade appears to be broken, but this appears to have happened in antiquity. And this is the spear after conservation and you can see it reveals the detail. Beautiful spearhead coming down to the socket. And once the corrosive material had been removed, you can see the perforations opposite each other, um, indicating the shaft was riveted into the socket. And here's one of the bone spears. Once again, you can see here, the rivets near the socket. And you can also see tool marks, but just along here, you can actually see the tool marks um, where the hollowed out animal bone had been whittled to a point. Um, this is one of the turrets that indicated that we possibly had a chariot. Um, and as you can see, 
Um, it's very similar to one of the ones from um, the King's Burial at Arras. Um, it's fairly complete, as you can see. Um, the iron turret ring here has gone completely. Um, and the bosses, you can see, have the rivets. You can just see here the rivets and another one here to hold the coral in place. It's been thought that um, these possible images are reminiscent of mistletoe. And we have this beautiful copper alloy brooch, which was found pin side upwards in the mile um, at the neck um, of the skeleton. It's inlaid with a piece of glass held in place by once again a copper alloy rivet. And its design is similar to a dragonfly. And this is another um, zoomorphic design often seen in the Iron Age brooches. Thought to be a possible meter or spit, this object consists of an iron crossbar with a bar extending outwards at right angles at each end. Each of these bars continue into or under a series of three animal ribs, which are held together in a stony matrix. The object was lifted on site as a soil block and transported directly to the conservation lab. The object was x-rayed and at this point the iron bar was freed from the stony matrix holding it in place under the animal ribs and it became clear that the two other fragments attached onto the main piece. You see these two fragments here, these two. Possibly with the third leg, although it's not clear whether the smallest piece joins onto the very end of the main piece. Upon removal of the encrusted soil along the interior surface of the iron, it became clear that the mineralized wood was in situ with the grain running parallel to the length of the object. It was not thick, of, it was not a thick material to warrant for further analysis. A complete copper alloy and nine nave band made of thin copper alloy sheet with a central horizontal doom band contained a strip of iron. You see the iron here. and the mineral preserves substantial amounts of wood from the axle. And on the exterior surface, where the red corrosion products have pushed through the surface of the copper alloy, you can see here the wood coming through. The terminals stopped short of each other and were connected with a further copper alloy plate held in place by an iron strip. You can see here. A complete iron linchpin and ring were also located and were in very good condition. The surface was covered with dark red corrosion. See, this is what it looked like when it came out of the ground. And some areas have cracks and splits, but are not fresh damage, but have obviously been caused in antiquity. So I would say it's pretty certain that this iron linchpin was not decorative, it had been working. There is no evidence of mineralized organic material and the metal core of the ring is also present. You see here, the metal core here. And it's shown to be penannular. Upon removal of the corrosion, this is very exciting, it became apparent that the top of the linchpin, this bit here, this bit here, had a circle of enamel. So highly decorative, and this is why I will not change my mind in terms of um, this burial is definitely a chariot. And as for um, the shield, well, our expectations came true. One of the best pieces of Iron Age art. Oh, it's spectacular, it's breathtaking, and it's from the North. You can see conservation have done the most splendid job on it. The boss here, heart-shaped boss, and with a tantalizing bit of evidence for a warrior. Um, is this a possible um, sword slash fits? So I think we'll take that. The shield has a central spine riveted to an Ovid boss. 
which overlap two crescent-shaped oval plates with exquisite repoussé decoration. A scallop frieze consisting of individual cutouts of copper alloy strip, we can see them, surrounded the central plates. The bottom and left sides were indicated by a series of copper alloy binding strips. Although binding strips were absent along the top and right sides, but the position of the in situ strips indicate that the complete shield was rectangular. These beautiful drawings have been um, prepared by Steve Allen of York Archaeological Trust to accompany um, a report um, being undertaken by Mel Giles and one of her PhD students, Matt. Um, and so I'm going to read some of the latest news that has come um, and this will be going forward into the publication for next year. Uh, the large B tab you can see here is thought to have been the original right hand side of the shield if held in the left hand with a sword or spear in their dominant right hand. This should make the left hand tab as seen, as, as seen externally by an opponent. The larger tab reinforced by the clips represents the leading edge of the sword, designed to both consolidate and reinforce the edge, most likely to be used to batter a foe, inflict a wound, and thus, with a punctuate, punctuated run of clips, enable the shield's edge to perform the kind of bruising and flesh-tearing damage. Yow. The eye is drawn from the non-symmetrical side of the plaques towards the symmetrical side and the larger tab in a clockwise direction, as with other Celtic arts such as mirrors. This simply means the shield has been laying in the chariot box in the right orientation as the corpse, but turned over, lying face down in the grave, as with other highly decorated Celtic art objects such as scabbards, a classic rite of inversion. And we've seen this rite of inversion in other burials that I've shown you designed to fox the dead and consign the object to the netherworld, known from other funerary contexts. And the final site, Yappin Road. Constantly throughout um, presentations, I've been asked, well, do you have any evidence of settlement? And the report retort back to people is, unfortunately, no, we just have the burials. Um, but our latest excavation, which has recently finished at Yappin Road Pocklington, we are able to add a little bit more information into terms of Iron Age Pocklington. And you can see these two roundhouses, circa 30 metres in diameter, um, which have obviously been moved around in the period. Um, you can see four central post holes. So again, four large central post holes, entrances. And so now we can safely say that we know where part of the settlement, of the Iron Age, existed. And it's quite a nice way to round off the talk in terms of watch this space. We have published already um, in Peter Halkin's book, um, our initial findings from Burnby Lane with footnote for the mile. Um, but in 2021, all being well, um, we will be presenting our results with hopefully some of the recent DNA results from Harvard um, with Oxbow. And I'd just like to thank everybody that has been involved in the project, it, or projects I should say, and um, the excavations really have been quite fantastic. Uh, I work with a wonderful team of archaeologists, especially my colleague Mark Stevens. Uh, the specialists have all are all the same, they've worked on the sites from Malin Holst, Conservation Lab at York Archaeological Trust, Jane Richardson from YS, Sophie Adams, Derek Hamilton, Peter Halkin, Malcolm Lilly, um, Dominic Powersland, and Melanie Giles. And last but not least, I'd like to thank the developers who funded the projects and thank you very much. Good night.